Hi everyone, I'm here at the Natural Dog Conference 2015 and I'm with one of our very special sponsors and supporters of the event, Wolf Tucker Dog Foods. Hello. Hello. So tell me a little bit about Wolf Tucker. Okay, so um, Wolf Tucker is a family run business. Um, we're really passionate about the health and well-being of our customers, dogs and any new customers that we get. Um, all our products are sourced from the UK, human grade, and we are DEFRA approved. Um, we run a series of free advice for our services, so okay. we like to help customers who may, might have dogs with allergies or skin conditions, and we've recently started a weight loss programme for our customers as well, and their dogs. So Not do they, the dogs have like a target weight they need to reach? Yeah, to so, um, so they'll let us know if they feel their dog's a little bit overweight or their vet's told them the dog needs to lose a little bit. So we'll start them on their what, the current weight and then we'll work out based on you know, the 2-3% to 3 of their body weight and uh, okay. so what help them all the way. Dog food does Wolf Tucker do? Because it's not yeah. your traditional kibble, is it? No, it's raw, raw food. Um, we've got a range of different proteins. We've got chicken, beef, lamb, venison, um, green tripe, which is really good for enzymes for the dogs. Um, we've got a range of raw meaty bones, which are quite popular. Um, and we're constantly looking for new products, but good quality products. We don't. We're quite fussy with what we supply, so... Yeah, and where can people find Wolf Tucker at the moment? Um, we're online at the moment. Um, we're based along the south coast, so we've got a few local outlets that stock our food. Um, but we ship all over the UK um, on our website, which is www.wolftucker.co.uk. And people literally go online, go online, you know, want to try some of your food, they yep. can order some and then it will get delivered to yep, them at do, a set time. Yeah, um, we do next day delivery. Okay. Um, obviously, we've got a cut off time, but yep. um, usually they all get their orders in nice and early. Um, or if people don't like doing it online, um, not everyone gets on, so we're happy to pick up the phone and talk to you, um, we won't rush you, have a nice yeah. conversation and yeah. help you. And can yeah. you think of any dog in particular that you remember has made the switch onto a raw food diet yeah. with you that's really changed? There was one recently, um, I think he, was, uh, he wasn't a pedigree, I don't know what he was mixed with, um, but he was called Diego and uh, the customer, she placed an order and then she panicked slightly because she hadn't tried raw before. So she was emailing me and I was email, emailing her for a good two to three weeks and um, he's thriving on it now and she sent pictures and it just really, because we're, we're a family run business so it's not a lot of staff, when we receive good feedback and pictures of our customers it really touches us and it drives us to do more and more and help more dogs and owners as well. Yeah. So, yeah. Brilliant, thank you, thank you <laughs> thank so you. much for coming and, and chatting to everybody. Thank you. <laughs> And you're enjoying the day? Are yes, you? yeah. It's my first um, conference. So I uh, came yesterday and actually your speech really inspired me. Oh, so thank you. I wanted to grab you at some point yeah. today to talk to you, but yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, I think I've got quite a lot to live up to after that introduction, so hopefully I will be able to um, impart information to you that um, you will find interesting and maybe questions that you've always wanted answered when you've heard about the subject um, zoo pharmacognosy. Uh, let me just, um, hang on, uh, oh it's there, there's a slide, <laughs> thank you. Um, <coughs> Okay, um, zoo pharmacognosy is, um, it's, it's made up of three Greek words, um, zoo, animal, uh, pharmaco, remedy, and um, cognosy uh, is knowing. So it, it's animal self-medication in all its forms. If you hear of pharmacophagy, that's also zoo pharmacognosy, um, but it's the study of insects. Okay, so, so what I have um, uh, founded is something called Applied Zoo Pharmacognosy, and that's where I bring a range of remedies, be it, uh, plant extracts, minerals, nutrients, um, to the animal so they can self-medicate and um, bring themselves back into health. 
Um, it's totally animal-led, uh, not human-led. And um, really, that's the key to achieving amazing results. Um, it's an innate behavior found in all animals. Um, <clears throat> and it is actually needed for survival of the species. Any animal, any dog, unable to self-medicate would not have survived its evolutionary history. Okay, so um, I trained uh, in 1984 with Robert Tisserand um, a long time ago in essential oils. But it was at the time I was training, I was looking into how um, animals um, responded to the remedies. Um, <coughs> I, I then went over and lived in California, and actually a lot of my work was with horses initially. And a pattern began to build up. I noticed that horses with separation anxiety would select narrowly, um, also known as orange blossom. If there was a histamine reaction, um, they would select German chamomile. And if there was um, respiratory infection, they would often select garlic or eucalyptus. And, and a pattern began to build up within both behaviors and also um, physical problems. Um, I found dogs a little bit more, um, not as easy to begin with as horses, because horses has, have a physiology that um, enables them to um, break down and metabolize a huge range of plant extracts, whereas dogs are, are much more comparatively limited. Um, with essential oils, dogs tend to usually inhale them, and that's great for behavior. But there were other issues that you know, needed to be dealt with with dogs, you know, uh, pain and perhaps um, things they needed to take by mouth to help stimulate their immune system. Um, and really the change came um, when I was in California, when my dog uh, was bitten by a rattlesnake. And he came um, into, into the garden with his neck sort of out here. And I'd never seen, um, you know, I'd never seen anything like it. So, of course, I'm going to take him straight to the vets, rushed him off to the vets. A healthy dog's blood count is around 200. Um, by the time we got to the vets, it dropped to 70, um, and he put him on anti-venom all night. Um, he was bitten by three rattlesnakes, and, and it was a really, really, um, you know, he was in a bad way. In the morning, the vet called us up and said, hey, you know, he hasn't responded to anti-venom. <clears throat> so, um, you know, do you want to leave him here? His blood count's at 45. Do you want to leave him here, or do you want... Um, to take him home. So, of course, I was going to take him home. There was little life left in him. Um, so, I lay him on the floor, and um, animals die from internal bleeding from rattlesnake bites, and blood was dripping out of his nose. He was not conscious enough to self-select, so I took the information from horses who had selected carrot seed for internal wounds, and I put it in a gelatin capsule, carrot seed essential oil, with a little bit of vegetable oil because I didn't want his airways to be irritated. And um, I managed to get him to swallow it. And almost immediately, the blood coming out of his nose went to a slow drip. So I was absolutely blown away. Um, four hours later, that picked up a bit. And so I gave him another capsule. And then it slowed again um, and but and it was not as bad as the onset so this happened uh, at four hourly interviews uh, intervals um, throughout the night um, each time getting slightly better um, and by the morning he was fine um, yeah he was weak there was um, traces of blood around the kitchen he was weak for a further three days um, and then he restored back to a healthy uh, German Shepherd dog. He was only a year old, so he had you know, a good chance of recovery because he was young. Um, <clears throat> so Adam, I, I then decided to research and see what animals in the wild select carrot seed. And I found that the starlings in North America would um, go out of their way to line their nests with the leaves of the carrot seed um, and um, other arom aromatic plants. Then... Um, scientists did an experiment and they took the aromatic plants out of the nest to see what would happen. And they found that the chicks were much more infested with mites. Uh, they took the experiment one step further and they took just the carrot seed leaves out of the nest. And they found that um, 
that the chicks had lower hemoglobin levels, suggesting they were losing more blood to blood-sucking mites. So carrot seed keeps coming up time and time again where there's internal blood loss. Um, I was then at a scientific conference um, <coughs> in Cardiff, and one of um, the chaps there said to me, um, you know, telling him the story, and I said, what was going on with the carrot seed? Was it coagulating the blood, or was it its effect on the liver? And he said, uh, absolutely, it was the effect that carrot seed had on the liver in re regenerating healthy liver cells. So, um, so from there, I began to look into how animals in the wild healed themselves. And then I began to introduce remedies such as spirulina, barley grass, uh, beeswax, macerated oils, which are often you know, very suited to, to some dogs. Um, and, and so it went on. And at this time, when I was studying um, and looking into how animals um, medicated themselves, uh, Professor Hoffman was also doing similar work, but with wild animals. And <clears throat> when he was out in the field, um, he was uh, following a group of uh, chimps. And he noticed um, that on one occasion, uh, this female chimp um, was very unwell and she was doubled over. Uh, she had diarrhea, she, um, she was lethargic. And um, then they changed their normal sort of morning route to a root that had a plant called Venonia amygdalina. And this plant is so toxic it's known as goat killer amongst the tribal people. Um, anyway, she broke it open and she sucked the pith. And um, after this, after spending some time with this plant, um, she took a nap, quite a long nap, and then um, she recovered. And then Hoffman noticed that in the rainy season, when the parasite burden was go is much heavier, that actually the chimps would go and seek out this plant to rid themselves of parasites. They tested the, um, you know, the constituents in the lab and they found it was full of sesquiterpene lactones that actually have an anti-parasitic anti um, activity. So <clears throat> we maybe can understand that um, maybe wild animals self-medicating and perhaps the more socially cognitive animals having this ability. But how about caterpillars? Um, they can actually self-medicate. There's been scientific research on this. Um, and, and what's quite interesting is um, if they're infected with wasp larvae, they will change their foraging strategy from lupus to poison hemlock. And they eat the poison hemlock until the larvae dies. And then they go back to normal foraging. If they're infected with fly larvae, so just a slight difference, they change their foraging to plants rich in iridoid uh, glucosides. Um, now, if they're only just infected, then they will take um, antioxidants. So basically, when, when an animal is just coming down with something, it's going to select remedies to boost its immune system, perhaps like spirulina, barley grass, um, and so forth. But when it's in more advanced stages, they're going to need more, um, a much more potent plant to um, bring themselves back into health, just like in medicine. You know, if we're sick, we need to have quite potent medicine. But when we're just coming down with something, then we need something to boost our immune system. Um, so the body is doing the work, not sourcing, outsourcing. Um, to, to um, plant chemicals or um, such like. So what I found quite interesting, and this has sort of been misinterpreted in many veterinary blogs, um, when it was observed that a, a dog got up onto a table, and even though there was an apple on the table, he selected the onion, which you know, is potentially considered a toxin to dogs, um, and he ate the onion, and shortly after, he purged loads of tapeworm. So just like the chimps, just like the caterpillar, he was using a toxin to get rid of a greater toxin. Uh, he wasn't in a ill health afterwards. He was absolutely fine. Um, I wouldn't suggest putting onions in the feed, as it's been suggested that I have suggested this. Um, it's an observation. And I think a really useful observation, so we can collect 
information or professional people in the field can, can see how animals are behaving in the wild and how they rid themselves of toxins. And now a healthy animal, yeah, that will probably poison them. But this, this dog needed it to, to get rid of um, something that would potentially be even more detrimental. Um, so both domestic animals and wild animals have the equal capacity to self-medicate. It's not something that wild animals are privileged with. Um, it's an eight. Animals from birth are able to self-medicate immediately, and this is needed for their survival. Okay. So it's all mediated by taste and smell. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, the more severe the condition, the more pleasant and beneficial the compound will become. Um, dosage is variable. That's a really difficult thing with this work to say, have you know, two drops of this, inhale it, lick it, um, because it's, the animal doses themselves and absolutely perfectly for the amount of time that, that's needed to resolve the condition. Um, so, the difference between food and medicine. Um, food is generally eaten until the individual is full. Um, and it's actually eaten as well when it's not needed. Because we can, we can um, store the food as fat in times where we don't need it. But a medicine, the body, uh, sorry, a plant medicine, the body treats in a completely different way to food. As soon as it enters the body, the body metabolizes it to excrete it. So an animal generally doesn't eat, um, won't eat medicinal plants as food. Okay. Um, the type of remedies that we work with um, are essential oils. They're incredibly potent plant chemicals. Um, they have the ability to influ influence cellular communication. Um, a huge range of different um, properties um, uh, are involved within essential oils. You can't put essential oils under one bracket and say all essential oils are, you know, should be 2.5% dilution external. No. No, what are you working with? Are you working with rose? Are you working with garlic? Are you working with an infection? Are you working on the mind? Um, so, so you know, valerian, for example, um, stimulates the production of GABA. GABA is a neurochemical in the brain that inhibits glutamate. Glutamate's an excitatory neuron. So if the animal is firing, has, firing lots of excitatory neurons in the brain, taking valerian can help to um, calm those excitatory neurons. Whereas chamomile works to inhibit the glutamate. So that's working slightly differently on the brain, and it's suiting the karma to the individual. Uh, chamomile seems to be suited to animals who have obsessive behaviors. Um, and rose will work slightly differently. Um, it, rose works on adrenaline, and um, when I say something does something, it ha there is an academic paper on it. So uh, there's um, academic papers on rose um, that have seen that it reduces adrenaline by 30%. Uh, the B2 receptor, it binds with, a chemical in rose binds with um, a receptor um, in the adrenal glands. And so the animal that maybe has been a street dog, um, who's living really on high alert, they're most likely going to take rose as one of their remedies to calm them. So it's, it's like a, a painkiller. So, you know, some people are suited to ibuprofen, some anodyne, and it's, it's, it's matching to get the best results, the um, aromatic chemical to the individual. Um, other oils work on um, COX-1 and COX-2. We have um, German chamomile and yarrow. They um, inhibit prostaglandins, so the inflammatory response. So if they're injured, um, it will help with pain at the site of injury. Um, other remedies, such as wintergreen, inhibit both COX-1 and COX-2, but I will talk about that in a little bit. Um, garlic, for example, um, binds with protein in the bacteria, and, um, <coughs> and it, it shuts off the, the protein supply in the, in the bacteria, 
whereas um, clove oil um, will shut off the sugar supply in the bacteria. And animals often choose garlic and clove together as a really potent antibacterial agent because ones they're both killing the bacteria in a um, you know sort of double force synergy, whereas Time perforates the bacteria with lots of little holes, and so the contents leak out. And it, it, it's just matching um, to the individual. Um, then we come on to the minerals, nutrients, um, and vitamins that we offer. And a lot of people think these are food, and uh, they can understand that maybe essential oils are the plant medicines. They provide no metabolic value at all. They're not going to be selected as food. But, ooh, you know, rosehip shells are just a little bit too looking like food. Barley grass as well, uh, spirulina. But they're actually treated as medicines. I have never come across any animal, not even the animal that eats everything, that will indiscriminately eat um, uh, rosehip shells or barley grass or spirulina um, and coming uh, when I've um, gone out and you know, worked with animals and demonstrations in classroom situations uh, for example I had a dog uh, came in and he's really really restless um, I put some calming oils around um, I sprayed valerian on the door um, nothing you know no there was no sort of calming influence happening at all um, so I thought, oh, okay, we're, I'll get straight into the um, session of offering him nutrients. And he wanted huge amounts of uh, barley grass, spirulina, and um, rosehip shells. He took about uh, maybe five tablespoons um, of each and um, mixed with water or rice bran, depending on what was offered. And um, this dog normally um, ate stones. Um, he's had to have loads of operations for eating stones. And um, he barks all the time in the car. He's always really, really restless. Um, and you know, that's something people will say, well, how about dogs that eat stones? Surely they, they're not able to self-select. Well, after he had selected his minerals, we never even got onto the medicinal plants or the painkillers or the behavioral remedies. Um, he was out. He was totally out, fast asleep, and they had never seen their dog relax. Um, he went home that night, and he, didn't, he wasn't even interested in stones. He had been satisfied with the correct nutrients. Um, the following day, uh, we offered the same remedies. He had absolutely no interest, day two, um, but he did select painkillers. He, he selected wintergreen. He just inhaled a lot. He didn't want any um, applied topically. Um, think of an essential oil like a gas. So you're inhaling, the animal will get tiny little particles into the blood. And again, he just flopped down, went to the back of the room, and just made sort of, uh, uh, those sort of noises of say, thank you, thank you, I was so uncomfortable. And he was as good as gold going back in the car, didn't bark, wasn't anxious. Um, and a lot of my work now is looking at behavior um, in conjunction with the physical health of the animal, you know, are, is there something upset? You know, within them, another another person came into the classroom and said, um, "Oh my God, we thought our dog was going to eat everything um, of, of your supplies because he um, eats socks and um, you know anything he can get his uh, sort of teeth into, and he didn't. He selected absolutely perfectly, but he selected stomach remedies. He selected spirulina to help coat the stomach." Sorry, not spirulina. He selected slippery elm to coat the stomach. Um, he's, he wanted by mouth um, German chamomile essential oil, which he took undiluted, um, and had no interest in taking any more remedies. His stomach was probably hurting. I don't know if any of you have had acid stomachs, and you know some people have to eat to calm the acid in the stomach. So it's looking at everything. When, when we work with an animal, it's, you know, first of all, how can, how can I help you? Um, is your behavior the way it is because you're uncomfortable? Um, and I go through offering, um, you know, various stomach painkillers and so on and so forth, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, just to give you an idea um, of this is, two-hour session put into under a minute 
Um, this dog um, was basically it was a wood green animal shelter. She was called Betty. She she wasn't um, she wasn't reactive, but she was just very anxious, and she would just jump up and down, up and down, and nobody could get near her to stroke her. Um, and when I, she was a really difficult dog to initially work with. When I offered um, a bottle of oil, she would run. So she couldn't cope with offering the oil. So I had to put them on pieces of cloth to begin with. And then I had the carer uh, offer her the remedies. And when we got to Rose, she barked at it with so much anger. And Rose, as well as working on adrenaline, does actually release anger. So this is what we achieved. Okay. This first, this calmest they'd seen her in a month. She's working with one oil in particular. Now she's been offered barley grass to help um, see if she needs anything for her nervous system. She never played before. Now she's uh, beginning to play with rose hip, uh, rosebuds. <laughs> and you know, her whole demeanor completely changed. She's been offered two different oils and she's selected hemp oil, two different fatty vegetable oils just in case she wasn't getting enough fats in her diet and her myelin sheath needed support. Um, and she takes as much as she needs. Obviously, if a dog has pancreatitis, then oil's under offered. And fatty oils. Um, and this is what was achieved. So in two hours, and she was rehomed the following week. Um, and it's amazing. It's amazing what can be achieved. Um, <laughs> so it's all guided by the dog's sense of smell um as you probably know they've got you know millions and millions of times more sensory receptors than we do um you know up to you know, some dogs actually have up to three million um and humans five million and within that um uh three million um they have 872 um, coding receptors. So they can code for different plant um, alkaloids or um, plant materials um, or urine or, you know, they can, they can pick up cancers. You know, we can't do that. They can. Their sense of smell is so incredible. They can smell a loaded gun from um, 10 miles away if, um, if the wind's in the right direction. Um, so when people say to me, when I'm offering lots of oils to the dog, they say, I think oh, you're offering too many. Really? Um, what's too many? Well, I can only smell up to five oils and then I, then I lose the scent. It doesn't happen with a dog. The dog is free to walk away from me whenever it wants to. And it might be just one oil the dog wants. It might be, you know, maybe they've gone through 20 different oils. They sniff some, they turn away from others. Um, and then they, they sniff another one, and then they come back to one and show more interest um, after selecting various other oils. So it's when they walk away, they've had enough. So um, basically, a dog is, is capable of smelling lots of essential oils um, and identifying what they need. Okay. Um, so when I come across um, behavioral problems, um, I find often it's undiagnosed pain, um, very often complications from being spayed, hormone unbalance, um, separation anxiety, um, past trauma or lack of socialization. Okay, so a lot of my work has been at Bath Cats and Dogs Home, and uh, they usually bring me the oils that um, really uh, haven't responded to any form of um, training and sort of our last result. Um, this little person here called Clara, she was really timid and you know, hid, under the, hid under the table, and uh, she had been that way you know, ever since she had been in the center. Um, and I offered her various remedies, and she sniffed them. Yeah, what I was going to say, a dog will not do a curiosity uh, sniff. 
Uh, with that sense of smell, they know what is in the bottle before even sniffing. If they're sniffing, they're taking the aromatic molecules into the body for a stronger dose. They can, that you can have huge reactions with just holding an oil to the nose without sniffing. You're just looking for the body signs, the eyes going heavier, um, and so on and so forth. Um, but Clara, um, she took several oils, some she wanted, some she didn't. And then I got to St. John's Wort. And she came out and she inhaled the St. John's Wort. Uh, she didn't want to lick any. I put it on my hand. I knew she had been spayed. Um, probably about six months previously. And I went to offer it to her abdomen and she lifted her leg out so I could really get the St. John's wort, which is a painkiller, all over the abdomen. And it's gotta be the macerate. The macerate oil has got something called hypoforamin, which degrades um, in any other solution. So the tincture won't work in the same way with the same effectiveness, um, but the fresh plant will. But it's, it's um, Anyway, so then um, she had really sort of uh, began to open up and work with, work with me. Um, I then got to sandalwood, knowing that sandalwood uh, supports bladder uh, problems. And when I got sandalwood, she just lay on the ground and opened her back legs like this, and this is not uncommon, with sandalwood, with dogs that have been spayed. And by the end of the session, um, she was playing with the students in the garden, sort of catch, and um, sort of, sort of games really um, and again in virtually no time we have a timid dog that is completely transfer transformed <clears throat> because she was probably feeling uncomfortable um, and and how do we know if they're feeling uncomfortable unless we ask them um, I'm sure all of us have felt uncomfortable I don't know if anyone's had cystitis but it's not something you're going to really talk about um, and you know, if there's infection, uh, you can, you know, it can be diagnosed by a vet. But very often, after being spayed, adhesions attach to the bladder and cause inflammation of the bladder. So hugely uncomfortable, but it will be diagnosed as actually there's nothing wrong. But you can find out if there is something wrong, and they might be absolutely fine. But there's also a lot of dogs that do need help and support. And also hormones. Can you imagine? You know, at such a young age, it's bad enough when you're older to have um, a hysterectomy and all these hormones flying everywhere. And I've had so many dogs where their behaviour is all over the place, and they've selected licorice root, um, hops, rose, and hormone balancing remedies, and completely transformed into a different dog. So behaviour, which I find so many of so many people tend to go into behaviour default is all because something maybe bad has happened to them in the past. I really encourage people just to make sure that it's not that they're uncomfortable, the hormones are out of balance. Um, then uh, Otto, for example, he was a little dog that they brought to me at uh, Bath Cats and Dogs Home. And um, he was going to be put down. He was a spaniel and he was four months old. And the, the vet said, look, if he's this aggressive now, um, because he would sometimes try to bite if he was um, picked up, uh, then he's going to be really aggressive when he gets older. So I offered my behavioral remedies to him. No effect. Wasn't interested at all. Uh, offered the pain remedies, and he took so many pain remedies. He inhaled a lot of um, birch and wintergreen, which is 98% methyl salicylate, um, which is similar to aspirin. Um, he took in a lot of um, Devil's Claw by mouth, St. John's Walk by mouth, Arnica by mouth, and then he went into really deep sleep. Uh, Rosie, um, who was his carer at Bath Cats and Dogs Home, took him home afterwards and um, yeah, back, back to her place, and she said he was much more playful and guarded the little bottle of birch that was there. Um, and normally he would growl every night, but um, he, he ceased to growl. Anyway, the problem resolved itself. And he, later they found out that he passed some, um, uh, he passed some um, skirting board, which didn't show up in an x-ray. So obviously his stomach hurt. You know, so when if he's picked up in a certain way, he's going to say, ow, please don't do that. So that, talk, that gave us so much information. So that's why I'd love to encourage this work um, into veterinary practices if 
you know, or with behaviorists, just to really find out, um, you know, is there something that's being missed because the animal can tell you. Um, okay, what, interestingly, with Birch and Wintergreen, which um, that works on COX-1, COX-2, so um, it, it's basically like other painkillers, um, conventional painkillers, it can affect the post prostaglandins in the stomach. Um, and so, so animals with a sensitive stomach might be really, I want, I want the wintergreen, they sniff a little bit, but they jump away. And you might think, oh, they don't want this. Well, actually they do, but it might be a little bit harsh for the stomach. So really important to offer remedies such as slippery elm and German chamomile, which supports the stomach, allowing them to take much more pain relieving remedies. Okay. Um, what I found out quite recently is um, a lot of dogs want their remedy applied on the inside of the leg um, where there's um, quite a large vein and they will lift their leg up for it to be applied. Another oil or remedy, they'll clamp it shut um, and it just seems to be the next, you know, the, the most perfect application for many dogs if they need a remedy in the blood. Sometimes by mouth is too strong, uh, but through the, um, that vein is absolutely perfect. Um, a little bit, so you can understand how uh, the remedies work when um, dogs might select hops, the essential oil for um, estrogen support. It can also help dogs that are perhaps um, over-dominant uh, because perhaps they have too much testosterone. So maybe they've been bred to fight because um, hops can lower testosterone levels in the blood and, um, and it, it binds, yeah, it binds with, sorry, lower testosterone levels in the testines and binds with testosterone in, in the blood. Um, so the general principles. Um, allow the animal to determine the extract, the dose, the route of administration, really important. Work in a calm environment, really important. If there's all distractions going on, you can't really focus and see what the dog's needing because they're distracted. Uh, really important to look at behavioral cues to determine which extract's needed. It's not always obvious. Uh, narrowly is really difficult to work with, which is for separation, because a lot of dogs don't want to be taken back to, um, to that memory. And so, for example, um, you know, I've, I've got on one of my videos a dog, at, again, at Bath Cats and Dogs Home who had obsessive compulsive behaviors. They'd never seen him lay down other than sort of down and up. Um, they said he must do it at night, but we've never seen it. Um, as soon as I offered him narrowly, um, which is also orange blossom, he got up and quickly walked away. So an untrained pe person would think, oh, that's not needed. But actually, he walked away and looked out of the window as if he wanted something to distract himself from the memory. And then he um, lay down and went to sleep. So it's, it's, when you offer an oil, don't just offer it and think, um, okay, you know, make a judgment. You need to wait because it, it takes sometimes a little bit of time, maybe you know, half a minute, um, and just see what they do because it might not look like it's needed, but it's the behavior you're looking at after they've inhaled it. Um, somebody sent me this in. She had lost her dog, and she found him um, um, somewhere, somewhere in the house by the um, uh, by the essential oil bottles um, because he was afraid of fireworks. <laughs> um, okay, so what, it's also been very successful at um, treating or working with dogs that are, have fear aggression towards men um, and, and other dogs. But I'm going to talk about against men and I'm going to show you a video how we worked to uh, resolve the problem. Okay, So uh, the dog that we're working with is called Bobby and he has been in Bath Cats and Dogs Home for eight months. He was put in there because he was so aggressive towards men that um, no man could get anywhere near him at Bath Cats and Dogs. You know, if he saw a man, he would just go for them and just you know, get himself into such a state. 
Um, and again, you know, he was going to be put down because it just seemed like uh, not resolvable. Um, so I have a, a video um, of how we work. So what I need to do is I need to change the perception through um, aromatic chemicals of this subject that the animal is fearful of. Okay, so you'll see what I'm talking about uh, with my Bobby film. It's eight minutes long, this film, and I will talk about why an animal poisons itself, because I'm sure you have, or why a dog might poison itself if it was so amazing um, at self-medicating, so I'll talk about that too. And I'll talk you through this. So this is a, a typical session that's been cut down to eight minutes. We didn't want to show a demonstration of him being too aggressive to men because we didn't want to upset him. But it's important you see the before and after too. So in his assessment, he couldn't even cope with somebody taking a photo of him. He would attack them. Frankincense. Do you want to have frankincense? So Steve's been sprayed. Sniffing that. It's the closest he's ever been. Sitting. Closest he's ever been Sitting. to um, a man, without worrying about it. So he's he's looking for any reaction. The breathing's changed. He's holding it all there. He's totally aware there's a man behind him. So his eyes are getting heavy, they're blinking. I would let him work with that, his breathing's changed too, and he's Now we know he likes the Betty Bear, let's, let's do Betty Bear with that one together, so he's sort of getting a synergy of the two, and see if he wants that. So his eyes are, his eyes are closing, his breathing is getting really heavy now. Just staying with the oils, seeing what he's doing. The two calming oils. Eyes are getting heavier. Blinking. It's, it's having lots of patience too. And working really slowly to get results. Now adding in frankincense for fear. And I'm looking for licking. I'm looking for anything here, so I'm still working slowly. Yeah. Breathing's got even more. Now he licked and he lay down. So for him to be that calm around a, a man has never happened. So I'm spraying. Um, Rose, frankincense. So Rose is offering it first. Make sure he's happy with it. He's licking the air. So she's going to stroke it onto him. If he didn't want it, if his eyes sort of you know, opened up wide, she wouldn't apply it. Or if he moved away, she wouldn't apply it. But everything is on the animal's terms. So now we've got to introduce Steve. Steve smells differently. He's, he's um, been sprayed with various calming oils. So he doesn't smell like a man. He looks like a man, but he doesn't smell like one. So this is the first step. He's licking the oils. Now, now Steve's gradually taking over the healing. So he's beginning to trust Steve. It's working at a deep subconscious level. And it's the first time in ever that he's allowed a man to touch him. Okay, now he's choosing two different oils, and he wants arnica. So his interest is yeah, in arnica, and we're, that's for pain, as you know. So we're going to see, does he want it by mouth? Does he want it on his body? He wants it by mouth. And now he's, he's finished with it orally. Oh, wow, he's really enjoying that. 
and he wants it on his undercarriage, or perhaps it's on that vein to get a stronger application into the blood. He's now being offered, he's got rice bran, spirulina and barley grass, but he's chosen spirulina as his preferred nutrient. And he's allowed to have as much as he wants. Had a little bit of barley grass, but going back to the spirulina. It's got a little bit sticky on his tongue. If that happens, water it down a little bit more. So he wants it a little bit more watery. It's sort of finding out how strong or weak they want it. The more pasty it is, the faster it goes into the blood, because it goes into the blood through the buccal membranes. If it's watery, they'll swallow it, and it will have a different effect in the stomach. So he's just being offered, uh, offered the spirulina until he's had enough. So he still wants more. I thought he might have just got finished yeah. but a tiny bit. Yeah. This is rice bran, he had half a lick but wasn't interested, so he's not choosing the fatty oil, which people would think, oh, of course they're gonna have fatty oils. Um, but no, he didn't want any. He knows exactly what he needs. So giving a little bit more, but he doesn't want any more. He's had enough, he's had his dose. Okay, so a completely different dog. We're now an hour in to a dog that can't get anywhere near men. It's just changing the whole perception through the subconscious, through smell. Smell is their language. Our language is um, speech. There's a smell. So that's relaxing. Now the guy... We are spraying the guy who he went to attack before the session. So this is an hour, perhaps an hour and a half later. So he comes out. Smell. He's got essential oils in his hand as well for trust, linden blossom. Good, yeah. good though. Yeah. He's too distracted to worry about What would be a good test of it if you were to walk away now? Would he? Yeah. So no interest. Yeah, Turned his back on him. Yeah. Oh, he's just not interested. He's he smells different. Now we haven't sprayed this guy, so he's not sprayed. So we're halfway there with him, but we're not fully there because he's not sprayed. And look what happens. So now I want to reinforce his, the positive. So I quickly get Steve to come in. So he goes back to that memory of men are actually okay and they're safe. And they make him feel good. Because when he smells Steve with all the aromatic chemicals, then it's all these sort of feel good feelings happening in his mind. So now he's sprayed. So I get him to do exactly the same thing. And we've got Steve to go there too. And he doesn't go to charge. He just wants actually somebody to play with him. And uh, two hours later, that's uh, Bobby and Steve. So it's pretty impressive what can be achieved through using aromatic chemicals to change the perception of an individual. Be it, you know, you can use it um, working with dogs or. Um, you know, anything that uh, that individual has a bad memory of. We can't change an animal, uh, but we can hopefully um, replace negative experiences with positive experiences. Okay. Um, okay, a really controversial subject that I'm going to talk about for a few minutes, and then I'll get on to poisonous plants 
is purging. Uh, a lot of people are really, really sort of quite twitchy about purging, and that's the one area that really puts a bit of a block uh, with this work. Um, because we allow uh, dogs to select remedies to, um, to, for detoxification purposes, um, and very often they select coconut oil, and obviously if they've got pancreatitis, we don't go there, um, or if there's, they're susceptible to pancreatitis. But what can be achieved if you allow the dog to purge, because that is their mechanism for keeping healthy, um, is incredible. Health is regained. Um, dogs with arthritis um, have you sort of been playing, you know, frisbee, which they hadn't done for you know perhaps a year, um, jumping into cars. Um, and what comes up when they purge is really fascinating. Um, it ca all this is sort of the coconut oil seems to get rid of this really horrible sticky mucus. And what comes up is sort of massive sort of scoops, almost like a whole horse food scoop of thick mucus. It's so thick you can't pick it up, you've got to shovel it. And in it, you look at what's there. And if there's food in there, it's usually food that they're not com compatible with and hasn't been digested. And it seems to be as well um, uh, cases, you know, there was Steve, his dog was on a raw food diet and um, he selected remedies to purge, but he just purged up some froth, but he was on game. And what came up in the purge was six little pellets. So they were so small, you would have thought they'd pass through the gut. It seems like organic materials, like socks and wood, they pass through the gut, but anything that's sort of chemical or toxic seems to stay in the gut and build mucus around. Um, I had a girl working for us, uh, and also a previous student, um, called Keone, and she rescued a dog that had a permanent cough. And uh, she offered him remedies to purge, and uh, he selected, as you can see, 450 grams of coconut oil, which is quite a lot, uh, three bowls of watery barley grass. And um, what he purged up was a, a piece of toy that um, had been taken away from him, that toy, six months ago. He was obsessed in this toy, ripping it to pieces. So they took it away, and he wasn't allowed any toys since then. So it had been in his gut for six months. And... Um, they noticed too, after he purged, the cough disappeared. So it's, you know, they're scavengers, but they also know what they need. Um, what, they, what they don't need needs to come up as their detox. What they do need, they absorb. And if we don't let them bring it up because we don't like it, we think, oh, God, they poison themselves, they've taken too much fatty oils. Um, then um, you know, th we're not allowing them to, to keep in, in the perfect health that, that they were born to, to, um, to have. Um, also, yeah, it's messy, nobody really likes a dog to purge, um, but it can really provide such great benefits. Um, so let's go on to poisonous plants, because I've got, I think, a few minutes left here. Um, talk about that afterwards. Um, so, yeah, if, if AZ uh, applied to pharmacognancy is so great, probably some of you are thinking, why do dogs poison themselves? Yeah, how can I trust my dog? Um, but you can. You can. Um, food, is, as I mentioned, is different from medicine. Um, I don't really work with foods. It's not my speciality. Um, but plant medicines I do work with and have done for uh, three decades. Um, there was um, a, a group of scientists over 10 years did a study on five European countries and looking into animal poisoning. And they found that um, in the wild, there were, they had no reported poisonings. Um, and with companion animals, Plant poisonings, um, only 3.9% only uh, Sorry, were due to plant poisonings. The rest were due to antifreeze, rat poison, um, and pesticides, and so on and so forth. Now, out of that 3.5 or 3.9%, 95 95% of all the plant poisonings were linked with ornamental houseplants. And that's because 
um, dogs and cats haven't evolved in the tropics where these plants um, have come from. And, and the same with, um, the, the same with you know, pesticides and uh, poisons. They, they, they can't detect them. They don't have the detection mechanisms uh, or the detoxification mechanisms to deal with them. And that's why they poison themselves. Um, the one question I, I had was with grapes. Well, why grapes? Because grapes has been in their evolutionary history. And um, that baffled me for a long time. Did a lot of research trying to find out why a dog would poison itself on grapes. And why is there only some dogs, not all dogs? You know, I thought, is it organic, not organic? Didn't seem to make any difference. Um, and then the answer began to unravel when, um, uh, first of all, looking at, in the poisons control book, um, the first reported poisoning was in, um, I think it was 1999. Why wasn't it reported before then? Um, so what happened in 1999? Um, and then observing other animals, um, meerkats, it seemed that with some grapes, they would roll, roll it in green clay, and, um, but other grapes, they wouldn't. And green clay detoxifies plant poisons. Um, and they would also roll um, sort of, if the chick that they were eating, the dead chick was a little bit older manky, they'd also roll that in gr green clay. So something with the grapes here. And then parrots as well. Uh, they would peel the, the skin from some grapes, but not others. So there's something on the skin of the grapes. And, and we know that there's a fungus um, that grows on grapes, that perhaps it's this fungus is relatively new and dogs, some dogs just cannot, they haven't evolved to work with that, um, that fungus, and so it kills them. Um, you might be thinking chocolate too. Well, how come chocolate? That's, that's a food. Um, well, actually, it's, it's a med you know, cocoa is a medicine, again, from the tropics, and it's masked with sugar, and it's masked with vanilla. Dogs, a lot of dogs love vanilla. Um, Anyway, so it's sort of camouflaged from them. And so therefore, the more, the more um, sort of um, wholesome the chocolate, the more natural the chocolate, the more poisonous, because it's more closely related to the cocoa bean. So then I can hear some of you saying, well, okay, well, how about St. George then? You know, um, Elang, that comes from Indonesia. So why isn't that poisoning the dog if he decides he, you know, wants to lick at some, um, which they might do? Um, and that's because essential oils are um, a concoction of plant chemicals that you will find across the world that dogs will have, have evolved with. They're just different um, quantities of different chemicals within the plant. So the animal is seeking out the plant chemicals more than they are the plant, if that makes sense. Um, so lavender, for example, um, uh, Elang, for example, has linalool in it, which is found in uh, lavender, cinnamon, um, and, and so the animal can recognize these plants. It's more the alkaloids that grow in the tropics that they've never evolved with um, that have been brought over here that is the problem. <laughs> I could show you another, um, another uh, it's a very short video. Um, it's sort of a three-legged three dog. And I found that dogs with amputations, um, if the amputation is recent, they want arnica, very often on the stump, and they want to take it by mouth. If it's a long-term, you know, if the amputation isn't recent, they are very often select St. John's wort. So St. John's wort is selected where there's chronic pain or anything to do with nerve endings, okay? Um, so this little dog, and it will just help you see this little dog is very restless. He's just been rehomed. He had his leg ripped off. It was an abu abuse case. And he smelt rose. Now, you might think, oh, he's not really that interested in it. He goes away, and you think, oh, maybe not rose. But actually, don't make your mind up at this point. Watch him. Watch what he does. He's been pacing for about half an hour before the rose. 
and he's down. This is so that's one or two sniffs of rose. So now I go in with um, some yarrow, and I want to see if if he, I want to see if he wants it or not. I'm not sure at this point, but yes, he does. He's come to sniff it. It's not a curiosity sniff. He's taking, when they sniff, they're taking the aroma chemicals into the blood. Okay, he's turned away to process, uh, she's turned away to process her thoughts. Okay, so she's looking pretty peaceful now. Now we're going for linden blossom, which is trust. Dogs that have been abused very often select linden blossom or dogs that lack trust. Yeah, yeah, dogs that lack so trust. she wants it. Burns. She's sniffing it. Or are really afraid and she'll take little and sniffs. She's really doing well in selecting what she And does. what they do is um, when a dog sniffs an oil, they're taking a certain amount and then they break. Okay, it doesn't want me to take it away. See that? So you've got to look for every sign. As I take it away, the head goes with it. So she wants it more. So they top up their amount. So you don't just offer one sniff, you re-offer. You wait. Okay, and take it away, but she's still got her nose, she's see, pointing, pointing towards the oil. So she still wants to work with it. So she wants to get a bit closer, she wants a little bit more now. She wants to, some dogs too really fight what they need, you know, it takes ages to get And she's relaxing with it, she's, she's looking a little bit more playful. So she's still working with it, so it's very subtle. But this the results are incredible. Okay, so now she's turned away in a little sort of process of thoughts. In the eye, but she doesn't want me to take it away. See, she's still sort of guarding it. Okay, she wants a, few, a little top up again. That's how dogs work with smell. Sniffs and then break, sniff again, break. I'm just going to see what she does. Has, has it finished? Is she going to want to come back for more? Don't rush. Um, for the best results, take your time. And, and you know, it's. I now go into offer yarrow. Does she want yarrow? Okay, and I'm showing a huge amount. Oh, yes, but she's licked. Okay, I'll just see what she does now. She's turned completely away from me and session is over. So as soon as they've removed themselves from you, that's when they've generally had enough, but you usually wait about five minutes. Um, good, okay. I had loads that I could have shown you on how it can help the physical as well as skin conditions, but um, we will call it a day here. <laughs> well, it's your lunchtime, guys, so. <laughs> I guess we're going to delay.